I wasn't quite prepared for this turnout, but I'm excited. Uh, so thank you, Jacqueline and uh, Bob Carino, wherever he is, for uh, inviting me to do this. Um, let's just jump in. Here's the plan for the next hour, hour and 15 minutes or so. Uh, I want to start off by defining what endogeneity is. I think that most of everyone in here is probably familiar with it, just so we're all on the same page and the language is common. Um, what causes it? I'll give a few examples. Then I'm going to move into what are the consequences of endogeneity. Some examples. I'll talk about what we can do about it. Uh, I'll focus on a couple of techniques, but given the limited amount of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail or talk about the whole broad spectrum of different econometric methods that can, you know, potentially address endogeneity issues. And then at the end of at the end of the talk, uh, I just want to mention a few practical suggestions that, that I've learned from my senior colleagues and other colleagues in the profession, just in terms of what I look for and I think what a lot of editors hopefully look for when they're uh, choosing papers. So I, I promise this is the most technical slide of the talk. I purposely <laughs> chose to avoid um, derivations and heavy statistics because frankly, if you look at the empirical uh, corporate literature, Frankly, most of the empirical literature in finance, except for some high-tech uh, asset pricing, the, the primary issues are really sort of economic and not statistic and not dealt with through technique. Okay, so what, what is endogeneity? Well, for the purpose of this presentation, all I'm talking about is I'm talking about the correlation between x and epsilon, the explanatory variable and the error term in a regression. That's it. And so what do we need for, for good estimates, consistent estimates, right? Estimates that actually go towards truth when our samples get really big. Well, you need a random sample, okay? Um, well, there's a little typo. Bear with me, you're gonna see a lot of those. Uh, you need a random sample on y and x. Right? Uh, you need the expectation of the error term to be zero, but that's a gimme because as soon as you put an intercept in, that guarantees that. You need the rank of x to be full, so right, there's no perfect multicollinearity, right? I, I restrict one of the dummies to be zero, that kind of thing. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, you need the covariance between x and epsilon, equivalently the correlation, to be zero. Th that is what this talk is about, that, that assumption. It really is the key assumption in most everything we do in applied work, at least in the social sciences. And if you want to think in terms of unbiased, you just replace the covariance, zero covariance assumption with the zero conditional mean assumption, right? That implies that, okay. But we're just gonna think in terms of correlation. It's a little bit easier for people as opposed to conditional mean independence, it's fine. Okay, that's what endogeneity is. And as Jacqueline mentioned, you should feel free to interrupt because I don't like talking you know, straight for an hour and a half. Um, all right, what causes that correlation? What causes the endogeneity? <coughs> There's three primary causes. One's just omitted variables. And I'll give you the example of a classic wage education regression. I wanna know if more education leads to higher earnings. Okay. So you might naively run wage on education, but what's sitting out here that's relevant for wages and related to education is something like ability. So ability is omitted. And that creates a correlation between <coughs> ability sitting over here and education sitting over there. That violates that assumption. We don't get consistent estimates. Not good. Measurement error. So what if our variables, our explanatory variables, are measured with error? Well, that's going to cause a problem too. That's going to violate that no correlation between the right-hand side variables and the error term. And two classic examples are you know, investment Q cash flow equations. We can't measure marginal Q, so we put some proxy in. That has error, that error falls in over here, that error is correlated with cash flow and Q. We don't get consistent estimates. It's hard to interpret what these things mean. Okay. Uh, the yield on loans or a bond, is that a function of governance? This is Jim, John Brzezici metric. He was my colleague, so I, I had to put this up there. Uh, but now that he's not here, I should take it out. Uh, right. So the interest rate 
firms pay on loans or, de uh, or debt more generally. Maybe it's a function of the governance of the firm, the governance, shareholder governance. But we know it's a function of credit risk, but Z-score, while a nice empirical proxy, is not a perfect measure of credit risk. It certainly doesn't encapsulate all of the credit risk components when a bank's making a lending decision to a firm. So you've got measurement error sitting out here, and it's probably correlated with both these things. That screws up the estimates again. And finally, simultaneity. Everyone remembers Econ 1, supply and demand. Uh, you can think of supply and demand in a finance setting with price and amount of a loan, right? It's clearly, the, the price is a function of the amount, but the amount is a function of the price. And so you need some sort of instrument to break this simultaneity. If not, you, you can't even estimate this. So omitted variables, measurement error, simultaneity. That's what causes violations of that no correlation between X and Epsilon. That's what ruins our OLS, or maximum likelihood, estimates of the parameters. That's what prevents us from drawing compelling inferences. And that's what the whole point of the study is in the first place. All right. So why do we care? Why are we here? Um, it's not to listen to me. Uh, Statistically speaking, what's going on, the, the regression parameters, beta, they're unidentified. In other words, when you run OLS, your OL estimate, OLS estimates of your betas, they're not actually what you think they are. And they're definitely not what you want. Okay. Practically speaking, what's going on is it just means it's really hard to interpret your results because your results could be consistent with any number of hypotheses. You can't rule out alternative explanations. That's a problem if the goal of the study is to answer a specific question, especially in the face of competing explanations. That's why it's so important to understand what it is, endogeneity, what's causing it, and now, hopefully, how we can address it. So let, let me make this concrete, and I'll give three examples. So the first is, back to that wage education or equation. And the reason I do this, even though it's not a finance uh, issue, it's just very easy to understand the problem. We'll talk, we'll talk about finance issues in the next two examples. All right, so does more education lead to higher wages? Right. We run this regression, and the question is, when you get the OLS estimate, or maximum likelihood, I don't care what procedure you're using, LAD, whatever, what does beta one mean, beta hat one? What does your estimate mean? One interpretation, the interpretation most people would want to give to it is what? Well, when I move education, when I vary the level of education, I'm causing the level of wages to vary along with it. And so if beta one's greater than zero, it means more education, higher wages. Great. But there's no way for that equation and OLS estimates to distinguish between that interpretation, the economically interesting interpretation, and the alternative that really what's going on is no, uh, education is just correlated with ability, right? Smarter people, people with more inherent ability tend to get more education. They also tend to do better in work so they earn higher wages. And all that beta one is picking up is just the consequences of the omitted ability variable. In other words, the regression just isn't answering the interesting question. Feel free to interrupt, because <laughs> we're going to be done in about five minutes. <laughs> All right, another example, a little closer to home. Yeah. So investment. Uh, are people familiar with the investment financing constraints literature? Is anyone familiar with that literature? No one? Is this finance? <laughs> Someone? I thought I heard a yes, I'll take it. All right, so imagine running a regression of investment on, say, uh, average Q or Tobin's Q and cash flow. And we're trying to figure out whether financing constraints or financial constraints matter for real economic activity, in this case, investment, but we can replace that with wages or something else. So we run that regression right there, and the question is, well, how do I interpret beta 2? What does it mean economically? Well, the way we'd like to interpret it, 
And if you think back to the 88 Fazari, Hubbard, and Peterson paper, you'd say, well, what's going on is when cash flow is moving around, so too are the financial constraints on the firm, its ability to invest, in effect. And so when cash flow goes up, the firm can avoid going to external capital markets where there's a premium because of information asymmetry, and that relaxes the constraint and the firm can invest more. So if beta 2 is greater than zero, we see that more cash flow leads to higher investment because it's mitigating the effects of financing constraints. But we know that Q is measured with error. Investment opportunities are really hard to measure. That's just a proxy. So chances are sitting out here in the error term is what? Things correlated with investment opportunities. And so the alternative interpretation of this is just that, no, 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 what's going on is cash flow is really just proxying for the investment opportunities that we can't capture with our proxy for Q. And so all that's going on is cash flow is positively related to investment, not because there's some relaxation of financing constraints and financing constraints affect real activity. Rather, it's just firms with higher cash flow tend to have better investment opportunities. And so they invest more. There's no friction there. It's irrelevant. Again, the regression is not answering the interesting question, do financing constraints matter for investment? Are people following? Okay, okay. All right, just checking. All right, last one because I like examples. Um, so yield, uh, th think of this in terms of, uh, loosely speaking, the interest rate on a loan to a firm. And we might wonder whether shareholder governance is somehow related to the price or the interest rate firms have to pay on their debt. And you can think of a variety of stories couched in incentive conflicts and agency problems among the different claimants. Okay. But it's a testable hypothesis. And so naively we might run, well, I'll take the yield spread on the loan, 200 basis points, whatever, regress it on uh, GIM, well, what is that? That's Gomprezishi metrics, it's their governance index. Just captures shareholder protection. And some proxy for credit score, because you know the yield is gonna be a function of the credit risk of the borrower. Well, what does the OLS estimate of beta one mean? Well, it could mean, right? And what you're gonna write your paper is that, well, see, if, if beta one's greater than zero, Variation in the governance of the firm is causing or leading to better or worse pricing on the debt. So there's some sort of real effect there. Right? In this case, the way Jim structured, if beta one's greater than zero, worse governance means a higher cost of debt capital. But actually what could just be going on is Jim's just proxying for omitted credit risk or mismeasured credit risk. And so all that's going on with a beta one greater than zero is <coughs> firms with bad governance, they also tend to be riskier. The bank recognizes that risk because the bank has a lot more information than we do as econometricians. And so beta one is nothing more than a proxy capturing the effects of credit risk. That's not as interesting. And so yet again, the regression's not answering the question you set out after. Does shareholder governance matter for the cost of debt? Right? And it should be at this point fairly easy to translate the theme of these examples into virtually any setting in finance. Frankly, any setting in social sciences. We don't do social physics. There is no law of the yield. Okay. So what do we do? So historically, and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to offend anyone, uh, we, we didn't do anything. Uh, what we did is we kind of told stories, uh, which was great a long time ago uh, because we didn't know that much. But now there's just so much evidence and so many descriptive facts, it's really time to dig a little bit deeper and figure out the why. Right? Why is shareholder governance, or why is shareholder governance related to the cost of debt? 
why is financing constraints related to investment, <coughs> at least in, from an empirical standpoint? Let me start off with what not to do about endogeneity, and, and this is a little pet peeve of mine, which is do not argue that you control for it by just throwing in lots of variables into the regression. That is not how you address endogeneity. And it's very easy to see that here. Um, I can't tell you how many papers I've seen where they say, well, we're just going to put in the credit rating, and we're going to put in leverage, and we're going to put in name your favorite credit risk proxy variable. That's not going to do it. And you can understand fundamentally why. When the bank's lending to the borrower, by definition, they're lending on material non-public information, stuff the public doesn't have, much less you, the econometrician. <laughs> There's no hope for controlling for all the relevant determinants of that price. I mean, that's just one example. What about the previous one? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to control for investment opportunities by putting in sales growth. That'll do it. No, it won't. No, it won't. So, so don't fool yourself into thinking it, 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 it will. And I know everyone here deep down knows it doesn't. So my, my first point in dealing with endogeneity is don't pretend that you can just find some magic variable to get rid of all the problems. I, I haven't seen that. Maybe it exists. I haven't seen it. So what, what can we do? Well, one can take a structural approach, and, and Christopher Hennessy and Tony Whitehead, I think Tony's giving a session yesterday maybe, uh, have just uh, made a career out of this. Okay. Uh, because I'm not going to talk about structural approaches, one, because Tony talked about it yesterday, uh, and two, I'm not a structural person. I'm, I'm, I'm a quasi-structural person. So I'm going to spend my time talking about reduced form approaches, which I think will resonate with more people in the room. Uh, since the, 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 ch the mass, easily 90% of empirical research in, in corporate finance, if not more, is redu of a reduced form nature. And so what's the goal here? Well, remember, in structural approaches, what you're doing is you're using theory to impose restrictions on the data to identify the parameters of interest. What we do in reduced form is we go try and find some exogenous variation in the variables of interest to identify the parameters of interest. Okay. Uh, what, what do I mean by what I just said? How many people actually understood this? No one. Okay, that's depressing. <laughs> but maybe that's why we're here, okay? So what is exogenous variation? So what, what I need is I need that endogenous variable, okay. that cash flow variable in the investment regression, that education variable in the wage, or that gym variable in the yield equation, I need that thing to change for reasons having nothing to do with the y variable. As if randomly. That's what we need. That's exogenous variation. Where, where does one find this? Um, and I think the best way to explain how to find this exogenous variation um, was put forth by my advisor, uh, David Friedman, who actually unfortunately passed away not too long not too long ago, um, shoe leather. W what do I mean by shoe leather? I mean hard work. I mean getting good data. I mean understanding the institutional details of the situation you're studying. I mean understanding the underlying economic mechanisms, why things might be happening. Hard work. There's no magic bullet. There is no econometric <coughs> technique to overcome the endogeneity problem. It, it, econometrics is just not magic. And I can say that because when I graduated in 2001, I came out of statistics and economics, and I thought I could solve everything with enough technical muscle. Uh, and it, it took a long time, but I finally realized my advisor was right, that there is no magic in statistics. Okay. So let, let's, think, let's think back to our examples now. What, 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 what would we do? I think a nice place to start off is th thinking about what would you do, ideally, to answer the question you're trying to answer. So think about the wage education. What would you do, ideally? Well, I'd take a whole bunch of kids, kids, and I would randomly assign to each child an educational level that they're going to attain. So I would tell Raquel, you're going to quit school in fourth grade. 
And I tell Mark Flannery, you're going to quit school in, 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 as a junior in high school. And so on and so on. And so, completely at random, just flipping a coin across the kids, in effect. If you do that, the regression now makes sense. Why? Because the variation in education is by construction totally unrelated to anything having to do with wages. We were just flipping a coin. So everything in the error, everything not in the regression, is uncorrelated with the level of educational attainment. And now I can look at beta 1, I can look at beta 1 and, 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 and interpret the way we want to. I can get rid of that alternative, oh, it's just omitted ability. No, why would ability be correlated with me flipping a coin and randomly assigning educational levels to people? Now, uh, let, let's come back to the real world. Uh, that's infeasible for obvious cost and, and ethical reasons. Uh, not necessarily in that order. Uh, but it, what it's doing is it's highlighting what we need when you think about the uh, ideal experiment. We need random variation in the variable of interest. That's what we need. Okay. So let's think about how we can actually do this from a practical standpoint. Okay. And again, please feel free to interrupt. Okay, I'm going to take a really great example by Josh Angrist uh, and, and Alan Kruger. Uh, so they have a paper in the QJE back in 1991, and they recognized this problem, which was well known at the time. And so what they did was actually quite clever. They realized that schools have a start age policy. So you, you start at a certain age. And for those of you with kids, um, you understand. All right. <laughs> And those of you without kids, I hope you understand. You got, to, you got to start school at a certain age. But they also have compulsory attendance uh, until a certain age. Right? So you have to start at a certain time and you have to continue in school up to a certain age. Think about that. Kids that are born early in the year right, means they're going to start at a later age. If they can start at a later age and still drop out at the same time as the kids who had to start at an earlier age, it means they're going to get less education than the kids born later in the year. And that variation, that little bit of variation in education occurring between the kids born early and late has nothing to do with ability unless somehow parents time the birth of their kids. I just, no. It's not like the smart people have kids in the fall. Because I had kids in, in spring. <laughs> I'm hoping. That's my hypothesis. All right. But, but the point is that the quarter of birth can actually generate some random variation in the level of education. Right? And so, what they do is they do a very simple instrumental variables using the quarter of birth of the child as an instrument for education. And so when they do that, they're basically taking all the variation in education and just looking at the piece that's driven by the quarter of birth and using that little piece of variation to identify beta 1. That's what IV does. And, and can you see sort of the, the the ingenious, ingeniousness of that approach, right? Because now, arguably, you can put a causal interpretation on beta. You can say more education, more wages. Beta 1 was positive. Okay? That's, that's what I'm talking about, random variation, exogenous variation. That's one example. Um, family CEOs and firm, perform uh, firm performance. So, yeah. What's your name? Uh, I'm okay. uh, but if beta on is significant, then that is will definitely say that there is a correlation. But if it is not significant, can you say that there is no relation? Right? No, we can't. We can only fail to reject, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And frankly, when you start doing IV, I think a practical problem is statistical power. Because remember what you're doing, you're, you're, you're taking all of the variation in education and then just taking just a piece of that variation to use to identify beta 1. And so when the variation in the x variable goes down, right, standard errors are going to go up. So you're absolutely right. Power is a big issue. 
That's why big samples are important. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. <laughs> so family CEOs and firm performance. I want to know if when dad passes uh, control or management to, to uh, his son or daughter or, or relative, whether the firm then goes into the tank or not. Is he better off passing it within the family or is he better off passing it to some external, someone external to the company or external to the family really? So what would you do? How would you actually answer that question if cost and ethics were no consideration? Well, what, what, what you would do is you take a bunch of firms and you go to each firm and you say, your firm is going to hand over control to a family member and your firm's going to hand, hand over control to someone external to the family. And you just flip a coin, firm by firm by firm. That's what you want to do. Good luck, right? That's not going to happen. So what uh, a, a study by Bennettson, someone, someone, Wolfenson did, not to slight someone and someone. Uh, what they did was something quite clever as well. See, what they did is they actually used the gender of the CEO that was getting ready to leave, the gender of their firstborn child, their oldest child. Uh, because it turns out that males are much more likely to succeed. Succeed? Succeed both. Succeed and succeed, maybe, I don't know. Uh, succeed dad in the position. Okay. And so what does that mean? It means that the gender may actually generate variation in whether or not you keep the company in the family or give it to someone else. But it's really hard to argue that the gender of the CEO's firstborn somehow has something to do with the performance of the firm 20, 30, 40 years later, later on. And so what they did is they used the gender of the CEO's firstborn child as an instrument for whether or not there's a family CEO. And they were able to say, yeah, <coughs> they were able to make a causal claim regarding the impact of family born or family CEOs on firm performance. I mean, what's the obvious alternative hypothesis had they not done that? I mean, right, in practice, we don't just flip a coin when we pick a succeeding CEO, right? It happens in equilibrium. There's a labor market, there's skill all these things that are relevant for that decision that we can't observe. So the first couple examples highlighted one, perhaps the most popular technique for addressing <laughs> endogeneity concerns, which is instrumental variables. And if you properly execute IV, you can tell a compelling <coughs> causal story. You can really hone in on the question of interest. But I, I, I bold italicize properly executed because um, at least in empirical corporate, that, that's a rarity, in my opinion. Um, right? Remember, what, what, what are the two key conditions of IV? Does anyone know, given that one of them's right there? How about one of them? Someone? Bueller? What's your name? Ben. Ben. It's got to be correlated with the variable you're replacing. Perfect. It's got to be relevant, but, but, but we'll be more precise. I'll get a little anal retentive here, Ben. It can't just be correlated. It has to be conditionally correlated. Conditional on all the other variables in that structural equation, right? Exactly. So it's got to be relevant. Some people call that the relevance condition. Perfect. But the nice thing about that, that's easy, right, Ben? Because we can just test it by looking at the T-stat in the first stage. Now, there are econometric issues associated with weak instruments. Stock and Steiger and Stock and Stock and Yogo is kind of the one that gets all the sites now, uh, but that's okay. That's just an adjustment to the critical value of the first stage test. The point is we can actually test that. Okay. Uh, what, what we cannot test is the second uh, condition for IV, which is exclusion. Right? What does that mean? It, it means that that instrument had better be correlated with the endogenous variable but it better be totally unrelated to the outcome variable, but for its correlation with the endogenous variable. And if you go back to the examples, the two examples I just gave, 
I think one can tell a fairly compelling case that those instruments, quarter of birth and gender of the firstborn child, are probably uncorrelated with future wages and firm performance. But I think you know, what, what, what drives me a little nuts is, OK, this is not testable. Okay. And there are eight exclamation points there. <laughs> and there are 10 here. What I, what I constantly see is, well, we test the validity of our instruments with a test of over-identifying restrictions. Okay. Why does that not really test for endogeneity? And I say really in a practice, from a practical standpoint. Does anyone know? What does the test for over-identifying restrictions assume? What's your name? Kyle's jumping out of his seat. You can say it. Well, does not correlate with the, uh, the error term. Well, it, it's in effect kind of backwards testing that, but it, it makes a crucial assumption in testing the over-identifying restrictions. At least the one variable is clearly exogenous. Yeah, it, it assumes one of the variables is exogenous. <laughs> but if, if I know one of the variables is exogenous, why do I need to? Okay. Um, and, and we know as you 